everyone. Welcome to this conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I am your host, Kimani Hendricks, Multimedia Communications Coordinator for the Foundation. And today, Dr. Ben Thrower will be answering your MS-related questions for the next hour. But before I introduce Dr. Thrower, I would like to let everyone know how to ask questions if you have any. Uh, you can either type them into the chat or Q&A box if you are attending from Zoom. And if you're watching us from Facebook Live, you have the option to type your questions into the comment section below. If you would like to speak directly to Dr. Thrower without typing everything out, you can use the raise hand feature in Zoom as well. There is a button at the button of your uh, mm -hmm. the a button at the bottom of your screen, tongue twister, <laughs> uh, that you can mm -hmm. click to do so. And if you're on a phone, press star nine to raise your hand and just wait until we ask you to unmute. Dr. Ben Thrower is the senior medical advisor of the Andrew C. Carlos MS Institute at Shepherd Center in Atlanta, Georgia. He previously serves as medical or he previously served as medical director of the Holy Family MS Center in Spokane, Washington. And he is currently the medical advisor of the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation and enjoys contributing to our quarterly magazine. Dr. Thrower, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for um, joining us this afternoon. Thank you, as always, to all of the, the folks behind the scenes at MS Focus and all the wonderful work you guys uh, do. And as I've stated in the past with these uh, open forums, I always have a lot of fun with these. You know, sometimes we hear questions that maybe have been asked before, but it's always good to update things. And sometimes we hear things that I've just never thought of. And it's, it's I, I sometimes learn as much from these as you folks do. So so with that, let's let's kick it off and see what people are, uh, are uh, curious about. So I've got one question in the Q&A from Gus. He says, if a patient is very concerned about safety, is it better to take a safer DMT like Copaxone uh, compared to nothing? As the platform treatments are low efficacy, but maybe better than nothing. Great question. And so anytime we're we're looking at choosing a disease modifying therapy, it's a balance between the, the effectiveness and the safety. I would put convenience in there and convenience is very much in the eye of the beholder. You know, what might be convenient for one person might not be so much so for someone else. But you know, and we even though we have therapies now that might be more effective on average for, for treating uh, relapsing forms of MS, say, uh, you know, a Tysabri or an Ocrevus or, a, you know, the, the newly approved Briumvi. These drugs are in general more effective than our old platform therapies like a Copaxone. We saw people who did wonderfully on drugs like Copaxone. And, and you know, I would agree with the statement that if you have a relapsing form of MS, it's probably better to be on something like a Copaxone versus nothing. And there are people who may find a, a platform therapy like Copaxone or the interferon therapies to be very effective. We have people who've been on those drugs since they came out, you know, back in the in the uh, 1990s. So yeah, good good question. An anonymous attendee in the Q&A asks, is it normal to see new lesions on your first MRI after starting your first DMT and use this MRI as a new baseline? So the goal with any of the disease modifying therapies is that we would see no new lesions, no relapses, no progression of disability. Every disease modifying therapy has a, you know, a certain mechanism of action, and some of these drugs work more quickly than others. Ideally, I'd like to see someone on, on a given disease modifying therapy for about a year before we decide whether that therapy is ineffective. So we don't like to see new lesions in MRI. It depends on you know how long you've been on treatment. Maybe for a certain disease modifying therapy, six months might not be enough. So it's that's you know, there's no one size fits all answer to that question. In part, it depends upon the disease modifying therapy. I've got a question from Naomi. She says, if your MRI doesn't show lesions, but you suffer from a wide uh, variety of symptoms such as fatigue, chronic pain, double vision, bladder urgency, et cetera. Um, but your tests don't show that you have MS, what else could it be? And how should you proceed with doctors who don't believe you? 
So the diagnosis of MS really depends upon having the right story, the right neurological exam, the right uh, testing like MRI, spinal fluid. MRI is highly sensitive for picking up MRI lesions, but it, it's not perfect. I have seen individuals that have subtle demyelination in the spinal cord and have normal brain MRIs. Uh, so you know, over time, typically the, the lesions will show up eventually on MRI. A lot of the symptoms that we see with multiple sclerosis, especially something like fatigue, are pretty nonspecific. They could be seen with many other health conditions. So we, you know, while we're thinking about ruling in or ruling out MS, we need to keep an open mind to other potential diagnoses, other autoimmune conditions, uh, for instance, uh, things like Sjogren's disease, lupus, in certain parts of the country where Lyme disease might be more common. You can see these things that, that might mimic multiple sclerosis. Um, we want to get MS diagnosed quickly so that we can get people on treatment as quickly as possible, but we also want to get MS diagnosed accurately. Uh, we don't want to be in such a hurry to get an M get MS diagnosed that we make an inappropriate diagnosis because you know that some of the treatments for MS don't always you know that there could be safety concerns with those drugs. And if we're treating someone for MS when they really don't have MS, what are we not treating? Maybe we don't have the person on the appropriate medication for whatever their real diagnosis is. Scott says, uh, I've switched DMT from Tecfidera to Copaxone a couple of years ago due to low lymphocytes. My results haven't improved much from 0.5 to 0.8, still below the normal range of 1.0. doesn't really have a question, but that's just what he says. Yeah, we've so we have seen people on the fumarate. So so uh, te Tecfidera, Vumerity, generic dimethyl fumarate. These are all in that class of drugs called fumarates. Uh, Bifuritam is a, a newer one in that class. All of these drugs do carry some risk of low lymphocytes, and we've seen individuals uh, like like what he's describing that have had persistence of the low lymphocyte counts. For, for years even. Um, if, it's, if it's gone on for more than a year, I do like to have people bounce that off of a hematologist just to make sure there's nothing else going on. We wanna make sure the person's not on any other medications that could uh, contribute to low lymphocyte counts. Things like carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine that we sometimes use to treat trigeminal neuralgia can sometimes be associated with low lymphocyte counts, but, but we, we do see that in some individuals. An anonymous attendee asks what your thoughts are on taking d manos daily to help prevent UTIs. And if you think this is a good thing, what brand do you recommend? So, so d manos is a sugar that basically when you take it by mouth, it's not absorbed. It goes into the, the bladder and it, you just basically pee it out. But what it does is it, it coats the, the, the bacteria. It doesn't let bacteria, especially E. coli, use the receptor that they need to bind to your bladder wall to actually start a UTI. So it's not killing the bacteria, it's just gumming up the bacteria and not letting it cause any harm. D-mannose is safe for, for long, long-term use. There's no risk of liver function problems or kidney issues with the drug. There really isn't a brand of D-mannose. It, it's, it's a generic, it's been around forever. Um, so so you know, generally we do a thousand milligrams a day of, of d manos by mouth. And I, I think it's a very safe, benign thing to do to lower your risk of, of UTIs. Another option of, of something that kind of does the same thing are some of these super potent cranberry extracts. Um, so the, we use one, it's, the brand name is Elura, E-L-L-U-R-A. There's some others out there as well. Um, these also bind to the surface of bacteria, especially E. coli, and prevent them from, from causing uh, binding to the bladder wall and it lowers the risk of UTIs. I do remember a conference that you hosted about two years ago on this subject. So uh, if you guys go to our YouTube channel, um, you can find it right there. I'm not sure if this would be the same anonymous attendee, but they say the side effects of DMTs make me miserable right now and hope for elusive future, which is no guarantee either. How do I reason with myself to go on DMTs? So you, know, you have 
we're all, we're approaching 30 different options now of disease modifying therapies. You know, these drugs we think of as like insurance policies for the future. They're hopefully going to prevent relapses, new lesions and MRI, progression of disability, but that you shouldn't be miserable from side effects. We should be able to find something that you could tolerate that gives you that that you know the protection without you suffering in terms of loss of quality of life due to side effects right now. So I would talk to your healthcare team, let them know, say, hey, this this is the side effect that I had with with this drug. This is not acceptable to me. Some of the side effects can be short term. So if sometimes if we push through for you know a couple of months, we can get past the side effects. But if you're you're past a couple of months and you're still pretty miserable, it's probably time to move on to something else. Ben asks, um, he says, I'm 61. I have PPMS five years on Ocrevus. Disease seems to be stable. Is there any advantage to change to a, D, a different DMT like Kisenta? So Ocrevus really is the only FDA approved option for primary progressive MS. Would Kisenta work in primary progressive MS? No one's done the study. In theory, we would think it should. It has the roughly the same mechanism of action. They're both anti-CD, anti-CD20 uh, B cell therapies. Um, it's just that you, in reality, you have an awfully hard time getting an insurance carrier to pay for the Casempta because it's just not been studied. So really, Ocrevus is probably the the best bet, um, and and realistically, probably the the only uh, drug that we're going to be able to get paid for for primary progressive MS. I just want to acknowledge someone in the chat for a moment. Um, Stephanie, I'm not entirely sure if you can still register for the webinar via Zoom, but if someone wants to watch it again, they can go straight to Multiple Sclerosis Foundation's uh, Facebook page because it's streaming live there. And then after we end here, it will be available to watch again immediately following. Um, Bridget, says if a person has lesions on both their brain and spine at the same time of diagnosis, is there any way or is there any reason why a neurologist would recommend MRIs only on the brain every year as opposed to the brain and spine every year? There really is not a, a strict algorithm for you know whether we do brain and spine every year or brain every year and spine every other year or if we are what we're really looking for on on annual MRIs are asymptomatic MS lesions. So we're, we're looking for that lesion that didn't cause you any obvious symptoms, but it pops up and might be an indication that your disease modifying therapy is not doing what it should do. You're more likely to have asymptomatic lesions on the brain than you are on the spinal cord. I get where she's coming from. And in, in my practice, I, I would do spine on a yearly basis, but but I could see the other side of the argument. Someone could say, well, if if she has a new spinal cord lesion, she's likely going to tell us about it. She's going to tell us about the symptoms because it's hard to have asymptomatic spinal cord lesions, whereas it's very common to have asymptomatic brain lesions. Jim says he has a Tai Sabri question. What are your thoughts on going from four week to six week infusion cycles to help with slump week? I've been on Tai Sabri for 113 infusions and still have the week before infusion fatigue is elevated. So we call that uh, that six week dosing extended interval dosing, and there's there's pretty good data out there showing that in terms of preventing relapses and new lesions and MRI. The six weeks for most people does as good of a job as the four weeks. The one of the areas of interest in going from four to six weeks is lowering the risk of PML. It does look like in people with higher JC virus numbers that we do lower the risk of PML by pushing it from four to six weeks. The challenge is exactly what he's saying is some people do get that wearing off effect. They feel crummy as they're coming up for their next infusion. And if you feel a little crummy for a few days on four week interval, are you going to feel crummy now for two weeks if we go to the six week interval? And that I think that is a realistic possibility. And so, you know, I'm we do have a lot of individuals who are in six week dosing, but I'm a little nervous about doing it in people who tell me they already feel crummy leading up to their infusion on the four week dosing. Gus asks, from your experience, what DMT do you find is best tolerated by your patients? 
Oh man, that's a that's a big. I would say it is as varied as everyone who is tuning into this program. The you know, be careful when you're on social media or you're in support groups and you're talking to individuals. Their personal experience with their disease modifying therapy, good or bad is their personal experience. I can show you people who do wonderfully on any of the disease modifying therapies. I can show you people who've had intolerable side effects on any of the disease modifying therapies. In general, if you had to say, well, what's the safest DMT? We've probably, had, well, probably Glitarum or, or you know, name brand Copaxone is probably the safest. There's still people who have side effects on that. People who get post-injection reactions or have you know, injection site reactions that are intolerable to them. So it's hard to generalize you know, across all of the disease modifying therapies uh, you know, and, and the million people out there with living with multiple sclerosis. An anonymous attendee asks, can antibodies from Hashimoto thyroiditis uh, trigger or exacerbate MS? No. So those those antibodies are specific to the thyroid, whereas you know some of the antibodies that we think contribute to multiple sclerosis are really specific to the central nervous system. Um, you know, there, if you have one autoimmune condition like MS, you could be at higher risk for other autoimmune conditions like Hashimoto's, but they really immunologically are two completely separate things. Chris asks, what's the best treatment for a trigeminal nerve pain? Yeah, trigeminal neuralgia is miserable for people suffering from it. And traditionally, we've looked at either carbamazepine or name brand Tegretol or oxcarbazepine, its cousin, uh, name brand uh, Trileptal. Those are usually our go-to uh, drugs for treating trigeminal neuralgia. And an anonymous attendee says, 64 years old, been on, I don't know if it's a bonus since 2000. My doctor recommends that I can uh, consider weaning off that and my MRIs have no new lesions and my MS has been steady for almost 10 years. What are your thoughts? So that is an area of a lot of research and interest. You know, what point can people safely stop their, their disease modified therapy? And, you know, uh, last year we had the DISCO MS trial that looked at individuals 55 and up who had been stable for five years and suggested that, that, most people probably could safely stop their DMT. So this is a discussion we have with folks on a daily basis. You know, I typically start having that discussion at age 60. There's no right or wrong answer. And so you, we can tell you what studies look like in terms of, you know, how safe would it be. But there's also just, there are other factors other than just the, the strict data. How comfortable is that individual? Are they a risk taker or are they not a risk taker? Are they going to lose sleep at night worrying if they stop their disease modifying therapy? Are there any financial hardships to them staying on their disease modifying therapy? You know, are they having horrible side effects? So we try to put all of those things together and come up with a game plan for the person stopping. But, but typically, you know, 60 and up, stable for five years. Years, we certainly put it on the table for someone to look at. I just wanted to remind everybody, um, if you would like to speak directly to Dr. Thrower, you can raise your hand through Zoom. I see in a lot of people typing out paragraphs and it's fine because <laughs> we're going to read them all, but just save the energy. <laughs> yeah. Um, an anonymous attendee says, my neurologist has determined that I have vascular insufficiency on the right side of my body, which he refers to as a secondary condition related to MS. Says my right ankle swells, particularly when the weather is cold. And I also thoroughly, I was thoroughly evaluated with a rheumatologist to rule out any other medical conditions. No problems were found. In addition to wearing compression socks and putting my legs up on the wall, do you have any other ideas how to correct uh, the annoying swelling issue? Yeah, so the, the swelling that we see you know, in the legs and people with MS, assuming we've, like this person was saying, they've ruled out other medical conditions. You know, we, we want to rule out congestive heart failure, you know, the troop you know, blockage in any of the, the veins that would affect uh, uh, blood flow getting back out of the legs. People with MS do uh, are, are at risk for swelling. Um, 
a lot of times it's going to be on the weaker side of the body. And when you think about what gets blood out of the legs, it's muscle contraction. So the veins have one-way valves, your muscle squeezes, blood goes up, can't go backwards. Uh, and if so if you have a weaker leg, you just don't have as much muscle contraction to get that fluid out. So like this person was saying, the, elevating the legs as much as you can, taking advantage of gravity, using compression stockings. If those things aren't helping, there are physical therapists that can do something called serial wrapping. This is a lot of times done through a lymphedema clinic. So serial wrapping would mean you go into a physical therapist and they're going to use ACE wraps and just really tightly wrap that leg, basically squeezing all of that fluid out of the tissues. You go back a few days later, they're going to wrap it again. Getting that fluid out in a really aggressive fashion like that will sometimes last people for months where they don't have that, that uh, fluid retention. Um, I'm not a big fan of diuretics or water pills in for, for uh, a swelling that we see in multiple sclerosis, assuming there's no cardiopulmonary issue. In a person with MS who has fluid pooling in their foot or their, their legs, they really are not retaining fluid. That's normal body fluid just going where gravity is going let it to go, let it go. It feels funny to me using a diuretic, trying to get rid of fluid in your, your body all over when you're really not retaining fluid. So I, I would rather not use diuretics. Another anonymous attendee wants to know your opinion on steroids versus no steroids for acute MS attacks. Yeah. So there's an old, old study, the optic neuritis treatment trial that, that looked at this, and there have been uh, studies over the years. In general, what these studies have shown is that whether or not we use uh, high-dose steroids to treat an acute relapse, you're going to recover to the same degree. So what the steroids really do is they make you better faster. So a lot of the decision as to whether you use, you use steroids or not is how bothersome are the symptoms of your relapse, uh, assuming that it's maybe it's a mild relapse, numbness in a foot. If you can put up with it, you're not hurting yourself by not doing steroids. We still want to document that relapse. So you know, that whether you're having relapses or not is going to factor into how effective we think your DMT is, your disease-modifying therapy. But there's nothing to say that you absolutely have to do steroids for an acute uh, relapse. Again, you will recover to the same degree with or without the steroids. We have a raised hand uh, from Alice. Alice, can you unmute, please? I don't. Uh -oh. I think you're still muted, Alice. You have to unmute yourself. Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> Alice, we'll come back to you. <laughs> um, Diane says, after 40 years with MS, I recently fell and broke my hip and started having mild MS symptoms. Is it common? for another problem to trigger symptoms. I'm 81 and I've never been on any DMTs. Yeah, so, so when you have a stressor, sleep deprivation, another illness, you know, just anything that kind of throws you off your game, it can certainly make old symptoms uh, act up. Um, the worsening sometimes, so let's say her walking is maybe getting worse at age 81. We think that that is not new inflammation. It's more loss of neural reserve. It's normal human aging, sort of making those old MS lesions a little bit more apparent. I don't think in that situation that I would push for being on a disease modifying therapy. I would push more for aggressive rehabilitation. We want to prevent that next fall uh, by work, having to work with a physical therapist and get into a good strengthening program to, to just try to lessen the fall risk as much as possible. Teresa asks, is there anything out there new that helps with cog-fog? It makes my friend crazy. <laughs> so cognition, you think, think of cognition as a symptom that's part of a three-legged stool. So the three legs of the stool are cognitive issues, mood issues and fatigue. 
any time one of those symptoms is acting up, it may make the other two legs look worse. So if your fatigue is really bad, your cognition is probably not going to look great. If you have mild underlying depression, it's going to make your energy levels and your cognition look worse. So sometimes we will manage one symptom by treating the other two legs of the, of the stool. We don't technically have a, a drug that is FDA approved to improve fatigue, even though uh, I mean, uh, cognition, even though fat fatigue is the most common symptom in MS, we don't have an FDA approved drug for it. Doesn't mean we don't treat it. We use things like modafinil or provigil or uh, new vigil or the stimulant drugs. We do sometimes try out things like Aricept, which is FDA approved for Alzheimer's disease and multiple sclerosis. I'm not blown away with the effectiveness of it. Um, I like using our speech and language uh, pathologist to help with, with cognitive rehabilitation, to help people try to retrain their brain and, and look at challenges that they have cognitively and help them function in a more effective way and work around those cognitive challenges. So not necessarily a question from an anonymous attendee, but they said that they can't ever wear leggings because they compress and it causes pain. So compression socks don't help them. Uh, their lower legs and feet feel worse. And they need to know that they're not alone in that. The, you know, the, if you think about a compression stocking to work, it's got to be really tight. And if it's really tight, it's probably going to be difficult to put on and it might be uncomfortable for some people. So we get that, that they're, they're not for everybody. Another anonymous attendee says, my new MRI stated that I had a new lesion on T-spine, but my neurologist could not see it on the CD. Can this happen? So the thoracic spine is probably the trickiest area to look at on MRI with the central nervous system. It's The thoracic spine is narrower than the cervical spine, so it's just a smaller thing to look at, and it's also a little bit more prone to motion artifact. So that's not an uncommon scenario where the radiologist says, well, I, I think I see this, and, and the, radi the neurologist looks at it and says, oh, I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, Realize too, when we when we get a CD and depending upon the monitor we're looking at, the resolution of, of what we're uh, doing on a smaller monitor may be different than what the radiologist is using. Some of the reading uh, monitors that the radiologists are using are actually you know, jumbotrons. They're quite large, so it is possible that it could the you know, radiologist may see it and the neurologist just not not pick it up. Before we jump back into the q and I wanted to check on Alice again. Um, if you can unmute, if so, please do. I don't want to leave you behind. <laughs> and Alice, there should be a little microphone button way down at the bottom of your, your screen that it will have a red slash through it when you're muted. So if you click on that, then you shouldn't be anymore. But. I don't know. She, hope she can. If if you're having difficulty, just jump into the Q and A, and um, we'll see your question there. Stephanie asks: Are there any devices that can be used for leg weakness and pain for someone who has a history with seizures? So the, there are all kinds of devices that can help with walking. And that's usually we, we want to get the, the help of a physical therapist and letting us select the most appropriate device. But it ranges from you know traditional ankle foot orthotics up to over-the-counter devices for foot drop. Uh, one I really like is from a company called Sabo, S-A-E-B-O, great device for foot drop, up to the electrical devices. So the electrical devices are nerve stimulators. You know, it, it, you we sometimes hear people worry about those provoking seizures and someone with epilepsy. They, it, there really shouldn't be a risk of provoking seizures if you're stimulating the peripheral nerve with a, a device like the Bionis device or the new. There's a newly approved device called the Neural Sleeve uh, that's out there. Um, there is a new. Uh, training program for walking called the PONS, P-O-N-S, Neural Stimulator. This is a device that we hope actually promotes neural plasticity or forming new pathways. Uh, in some studies, it's been shown to, to improve walking when combined with aggressive physical therapy. 
I've not seen any data on that for seizure risk. I could see where that one, because it, it, the stimulator is going under your tongue and it is providing some level of neural stimulation to the central nervous system. Probably would have to think about that some in someone with the history of epilepsy. Another anonymous attendee asks, mm -hmm. uh, can lesions disappear or decrease in size? And does this mean your body is remyelinating? So yes, so about statistically about 5% of MS lesions do disappear. That's really a function of timing. So if, when you see an, a brand spanking new lesion on MRI, a lot of the volume of that lesion is water. So for about four to six weeks, there's a lot of, of active inflammation within a new MS lesion. As that inflammation quiets down, whether just with time or with steroids, that water content with the inflammation is going to go away. So the volume of that white spot is going to get smaller. Sometimes it gets so small that it disappears from the MRI. That really depends upon us catching it brand new on, on MRI. So when lesions disappear, it probably is not so much an indication of, of remyelination as it is an indication of inflammation going away. One of the challenges as we move forwards in MS research is you know, we are getting closer with research to the idea of, of remyelination. We don't think any a therapy that remyelinates the brain or spinal cord will necessarily make MRI lesions go away. When we look at a white spot, an MRI, a chronic white spot, putting the, 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 the active inflammation aside, the water content, if we look at a lesion that's been there for more than a couple of months, what we're really seeing on that white spot is scar tissue. It's gliosis. When we, if we were to remyelinate the nerve fibers within that white spot, we're not taking the gliosis away. We may improve function and we've remyelinated the nerve fiber, we, but we don't think that remyelination strategies will necessarily make the white spots go away. So in research where we're looking at remyelination studies or, or, or uh, therapies, we're doing research-based research, uh, research -based MRI techniques that truly are focused on remyelination. Things like MTR, magnetization transfer ratio, uh, you know, diffusion tensor studies that are more geared towards looking at whether the, the, the nerve fibers are intact and whether they're myelinated or not. Another anonymous attendee says, do you see any effects from dietary interventions in your patients? If yes, what diets have you seen helps the most? So, yes, um, diet studies are tough. You know, it's hard to control for just that study, but there has been some recent research looking at things like the WALS protocol, intermittent fasting, Mediterranean diets. Um, I, and there is some evidence out there that those may help with, with calming down inflammation. The traditional American diet is probably not the healthiest, and we could probably all get rid of some of the saturated fats and bad things that, that we eat. I think the other way of thinking about diet is in the big picture. People with MS don't tend to die from MS. They die of heart disease, cancer, and stroke. So by cleaning up our diet, we're probably helping our health overall. Um, I'm a fan of the Mediterranean diet just because I think it's it's it fits people's lifestyles. If you are looking at a dietary change that is really radical and really difficult for you to stick with, you're probably not going to stick with it. You know, things like uh, you know, the intermittent fasting or, or our old swank diet or MS diet. The swank diet was is very, very low fat, probably very heart healthy, but it limits you to about 20 grams of fat per day. Most people can't stick to that for a long period of time. So I, I think the Mediterranean diet's a nice, nice compromise between being anti-inflammatory and being something that is, is actually realistic that you could stick to. Actually, I agree with that because I um, that is my current diet. I've been doing it since January of this year, and I've cut all saturated uh, trans fat or mostly uh, saturated fat. I do uh, keep that to a small percentage, but trans fat, don't do it anymore, and it feels amazing. So, and, I, you, and you eat stuff that tastes good. I mean, you can have yes. you know avocado and olive oil, and have a glass of red wine, and so you're you're not you know living a, a crazy lifestyle. 
I mean, half, I don't know what percentage of the world follows a Mediterranean diet, but it's, it's certainly, you know, common and, and uh, yeah, something that's enjoyable. It is. Judy wants to know uh, what the reason is. What's the reason why my MRI fails to do a lesion plot count? So in research, we're we're very objective about what we look at on MRIs. We do, you know, volumetric studies, you know, quantitative studies. We do lesion counts. We do we measure different things in the brain and give them cubic millimeter volumes. That's not done in standard practice outside of research. We're getting there. Um, it's it, you know it it is expensive. There has been some concern about the quality of some of these computer based uh, models that that measure these different things. So yeah, outside of research, most MRIs are going to be you know someone is saying, well, I'm looking at all the spots and I'm matching them up, not necessarily you know counting them or doing volumetric studies. Uh, so so that's a that's more common than not outside of research that you're not going to get those kind of numbers. Someone in Q and A says, "I'm lucky in that I don't have too many problems with my legs or gait, but all my pain is in my arms, shoulders, and neck. Is this normal for MS?" So normal in MS is a is a tricky term because again, it's so varied from from person to person. Um, Muscle tone tends to be higher in most people with MS, and some people you know, are going to manifest that as tightness in their legs, whereas other people are going to feel it more up here. We always want to make sure that we're not blaming everything on MS when, you know, and, and maybe someone really has you know, just more routine degenerative wear and tear, say, in their cervical spine that's contributing to neck pain. A lot of times with neck and arm pain, we can make an educated guess about whether it's muscle tightness from MS or it's just more routine wear and tear in the neck, but it may not matter that much because a lot of times we're going to end up using physical therapy and, and sort of, you know, non-surgical techniques to try to manage that. And the treatment may be the same regardless of whether it's, it's just routine wear and tear in the neck or uh, MS related tightness. Ms. Coleman says, I've been diagnosed with MS since 97, and recently I've been experiencing symptoms of spondylosis, uh, which has, which was found during my lumbar MRI. Is this common? So lumbar spondylosis would not be a direct result of MS. It might be indirectly related. So if your walking is, is thrown off due to your MS, you know, for instance, a lot of people with foot drop do something called circumduction. They swing their leg out and around so that they don't catch their toes. That does put more stress on your knee and your hip and your lower back. So it could be that the spondylitic changes, the, 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 the wear and tear we see in the, in the lower back is indirectly correlated. Just you know, realize that, that lumbar degenerative changes are just common, common in humans. It's rare that we look at an MRI of the cervical spine or the lumbar spine in an adult and don't see some degenerative wear and tear. It's just most of us have a little bit of it. So yeah, common, but not directly related to her MS. Jim asks, how do you think existing symptoms will be changed after remyelination? We hope they get less. That's the whole so the whole goal of of you know remyelination or neural repair strategies. You know, right now in MS, we primarily play in three kind of buckets or sandboxes. We treat relapses, we manage symptoms, we try to prevent future problems with a disease modifying therapy. We want a fourth bucket or sandbox. We want to be able to repair damage and reverse symptoms and improve function in, in people. An anonymous attendee with whom I am jealous, uh, and you'll find out in a minute, he <laughs> says, you live in the sunny part of the globe, Greece. Does nice. sunscreen take away the natural D3 from the sun? Yeah, so I mean, so sunlight does convert inactive vitamin D into the active form, the D3, and, and the sunscreen, sunblocks do help, do prevent that. Uh, or at least decrease it. Um, realize your 
your benefit from sunlight in terms of vitamin D is maxed out after 10 minutes in the sun. So you don't have to be out there, you know, tanning all the time. Living somewhere sunny like Greece, he's even using sunblock. He, this person's probably still getting the maximum benefit if they're outside at all, getting the maximum benefit from the sunlight. We see individuals with MS who are doing all the right things. They have a decent diet, they've got sunlight exposure and their vitamin D levels are still low. Some of that is genetic. And so when we look at the 200 plus genes that put a person at risk for MS, a number of those genes have to do with vitamin D metabolism. 85% of people with MS are vitamin D deficient and even when they're doing all the right stuff. So most people with MS are going to need to be on a good vitamin D supplement even when they're getting good sunlight exposure. Another anonymous attendee has a question and a comment. Uh, first, what's your take on late onset MS? I was recently diagnosed at 67 and dealt with uh, incipitory grief at the same time and now grief. I don't see much in PubMed on patients with such late diagnoses and the role of stress. So the politically correct official statement on stress and MS is that stress does not directly put a person at higher risk for MS. It clearly worsens symptoms when people have an established diagnosis of MS. The It's been said that people who have a later onset of MS may follow a worse course. I'm not sure I believe that. Because by saying that, we're also, I think, showing a, a lack of humility on the part of the medical community and not acknowledging that when we diagnose someone's MS is not really when that person's MS started. I think in a lot of individuals who are diagnosed later in life, they've probably been dealing with symptoms for a long time. Uh, if we could go back in time and the person diagnosed at 67 and do an MRI when they were 40, I think in some, in some of those people, we would have seen MRI changes way before their MS diagnosis. So you could argue that maybe they've actually been following a, you know, a milder, slowly progressive course of MS for years and years, and then finally something happens and, and the MS is finally unmasked. So I, I wouldn't... Um, uh, follow a doom and gloom sort of prognosis for someone diagnosed at age 67. Uh, we want to still talk about, you know, managing symptoms appropriately, managing any mood issues appropriately. One of the areas that, of research that we're very interested in is, you know, finding the best exercise and wellness programs for people who are, uh, uh, you know, living with MS at, at age, you know, 60, 70, 80, uh, and making sure that they are staying as active and healthy as possible. Teresa asks, um, well, she says, I'm seeing the sleeve for the leg for foot drop. Are you hearing good things about it? Um, we, we know it's approved. We, uh, just total transparency. We've been, uh, actively trying to get our hands on one with high tech pieces of equipment like that. We like for our physical therapist to be able to actually put it on the individual living with MS and try it out to see if it does what they want it to do before we start fighting with insurance companies or the person is, is, you know, uh, spending money out of their pocket. Um, uh, we've had a hard time getting our hands on, on one. So like with, you know, Bioness and, and, you know, walk aid and the over the counter Sabo device, we have all of those that we can let people try out. We've not been able to get our hands on the, the neural sleeve. We're still very excited to do so. It looks great. It's cheaper than the Bioness, uh, unit and we would love for it to, to work. I just, we, we don't have any experience with it yet because we've not been able, able to get our hands on one. Million dollar question coming up. How close are we to a cure or how close do you think we are? Yeah, that, and so I, I will always have people step back on that question and realize that when you say cure, that, that may mean different things to different people. If I'm 22 years old and I'm newly diagnosed, if you told me there was a therapy that could freeze my MS in place and I'm never going to have disability from it, that's pretty close to a cure. And I would argue for a lot of people, we have those things right now. With many of our disease-modifying therapies, we do freeze people's MS in place right here and right now. If I'm 
60 years old and I'm uh, using a, a walker or a, a wheelchair to get around, I want something that's going to reverse that disability. I want you to get rid of my symptoms. You know, that's neural repair. We are getting closer, you know, I, whether you're looking at, you know, small molecules that might uh, remyelinate or clean up gliosis, or you're looking at mesenchymal stem cells, there are studies all around the globe being done with all of those things. And it's not just in multiple sclerosis. If something works in spinal cord trauma, there's a chance that it works in multiple sclerosis also. And so those researchers outside of the MS world, you know, are, are actively pursuing those things. Putting an exact time on it is, is tough. I mean, sometimes science goes in stops and starts. It's like, you know, it may seem for a while like nothing much is happening on the surface when in fact there's a lot of basic research and animal research going on and all of a sudden things move very quickly. Um, research that they're doing, looking at repurposing known FDA approved molecules to see if maybe just by luck, they, they actually promote neural repair. That sort of research could also move very, very quickly. I would say we are a much closer now than we were 10 years ago. You know, it wasn't that long ago that when you talked about neural repair, there were uh, any number of neurologists who said it's it's a dream. It's never going to happen. You're wasting your time on doing that. You know, if you go back into the 1970s, uh, you know, looking at where we're at now, in academic settings, there were uh, uh, neurologists, academic neurologists who discouraged young people from, from studying MS at all because they said it was a waste of time. There's, you're never going to have any treatment that changes the course of MS. And that was clearly incorrect. And I think we will, at some point in the near future, look back and say, I can remember when people said that we would never be able to repair damage in the central nervous system. And we will know that that was also incorrect. An anonymous attendee asks if you have any tips and tricks to improve cognition, processing, speed, and memory. Say they have 70 new lesions, I'm sorry, nearly 70 lesions in their brain, and they feel the effects more recently. So we want to make sure that the person's getting adequate sleep, that their energy levels are adequate, and that we're not dealing with any underlying mood issues because those things are all going to magnify that, that cognitive dysfunction. I really like people getting in people in with a speech language pathologist. In some centers, it might be an occupational therapist. And what we really want to work on is cognitive rehabilitation. How do we retrain the brain? You know, just like we want to see people actively engaged in extra physical exercise, physical therapy to keep their body strong, we want them engaged in cognitive exercise to try to keep their cognition strong. And, and one of the best ways of doing that is by working with a, a speech language pathologist. Another anonymous attendee says they suffer from foot drop due to severe spasticity and wants to know if there's racing that's available. Yeah, so that's a great point. So when you think about, you know, the foot drop, your foot drop, when we, the thing of classic foot drop is because the muscles to raise the foot up are weak. Well, if you have spasticity, the muscles that push the foot down are overactive. So you can't raise your toes up if you have spasticity that's driving your foot down. We don't really want to do bracing for that. We want to get that, get that spasticity under control, whether it's through aggressive stretching exercises, um, through medications like baclofen, tizanidine. Our, our braces and our, you know, the neural sleeve, the bionis devices, those devices really cannot work until we get that spasticity under control. So we want to get that treated first, and then that's going to let us see how much true weakness is there and what the most appropriate bracing is going to be for that true weakness. Another anonymous attendee wants to know how much vitamin D they should take daily and how many uh, MRIs they should have and how often. They said they were diagnosed a year ago at 59. After two years of symptoms, they have primary progressive illness and they received their third dose of overdose. So the vitamin D dose really depends upon what the blood levels are. So if you don't know what your blood levels of, of, of 25 hydroxy vitamin D are, and you're just going to take some vitamin D blindly, I would probably not take more than 4,000 units a day. 
vitamin D has side effects if you get too much of it. So if you're just doing it blindly, I would say 4,000 units a day. Ideally, you want to get your blood levels checked um, and then base the dosing upon what those blood levels are. Because most people with MS are vitamin D deficient, we use a lot of an over-the-counter 50,000 unit once weekly form. I like it because it's cheap. It's easy. It's, it's just one pill per week. That's also a potential downside. For some people, it's, it's too easy. It's easy to forget it because that's just one per week. So we want to come up with the uh, devise a plan that's right for the individual based upon their, their blood levels. Um, they'll let us know kind of where we're, we're starting at. So there was a second part to that question. It was the vitamin D. What was the other part? Um, how often you should MRIs. So in relapsing forms of MS, the general rule is, is annual MRIs. But you know, over years, if the person's MRI is just stable, 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 we may back off on that. Primary progressive MS, we may do less frequent MRIs from the get-go. Primary progressive MS is not as active and dynamic on MRI as relapsing forms. Uh, primary progressive MS tends to be more of a spinal cord disease than a brain disease. So that one, you may see less frequent MRIs from, from, from the get-go. Again, a, a lot of these things, you know, there's, there's not you know, one, a one-size-fits-all answer. It's gonna be a discussion between the, the, the uh, healthcare team and the individual living with MS. You know, someone who has horrible claustrophobia is probably not gonna be thrilled about an annual MRI. And maybe we go to every other year just to, to, to be nice and not torture them with the MRI. You know, someone that's got a you know, huge copay on their MRI, maybe we do them a little bit less frequent if, if we can't find funding mechanisms to help with that, that uh, financial piece. Tiffany wants to know if menopause affects MS and if so, how? Not not drastically. So we you know when we we know there is a hormonal uh, sort of effect in women living with MS, and it, and the most dramatic of manifestation of that is is pregnancy. You know, MS tends to quiet down, especially during the second and third trimesters of pregnancy. Tends to be you have a little higher risk risk of MS relapses for the six months after the baby's born, but we don't sit tend to see as dramatic of an effect with menopause. Um, they've it's been a little hard to tease out sometimes because, you know, with menopause, you also have just women getting older. And so sometimes we see a little bit of subtle progression just with normal human aging and loss of neural reserve. And it's really not the hormonal component. It's the same sort of effect that we see in men. It's just the loss of neural reserve. So bottom line is we don't see a dramatic effect of, of um, uh, menopause. If, the other part of that question that comes up is, well, is hormone replacement, you know, okay in postmenopausal women? That's really a discussion between the GYN and the woman living with MS. Uh, we wouldn't discourage it or encourage it. It's, you know, the, the hormone replacement that's typically used in the United States is going to be estradiol. We don't think it's a big player one way or the other in the, in the MS world. So if someone needs to be on it because they're having horrible hot flashes or there's some other medical reason that the woman and her GYN think she needs to be on, we're absolutely fine with it. A friend from Greece gave us an open invitation, Dr. Thurman. Oh man, that sounds like, I think we need to do our next uh, uh, town hall from there. I agree. They also told you that it's a great place to retire. I, I would imagine I uh, was, we were talking earlier, I just got back from Italy, which I'd never been to before and, and on the Amalfi coast. And it was, uh, I'm sure Greece is amazing. My son and his wife were going to go spend three weeks in Greece. He's in the school of public health and they have a, a, a an externship. So he will be there in May for three weeks. Okay. Um, another anonymous attendee says that they see a lot of advertisements for the TAPO patch. Um, and what's your opinion on it? Have you seen it work? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I think the, the, the hard data on that to show that it works is, is almost non-existent. Um, I think it's benign. I don't think it's going to hurt anyone. Um, it is an expense out of pocket. The my limited experience and the, the handful of individuals with MS who have tried it out has 
I've not been impressed with it doing anything. Um, but again, we all have to chart our own healthcare course and, and take the information we, we have at hand and make the decision that's right for us. I don't think there's any big risk to trying it. We've got uh, two more questions that I can see. So first, is it preferred to see a, um, a physical therapist or a, hang on. I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank here. A physiatrist or a physical therapist to determine what uh, the best advice is for a foot drop. <laughs> So those are different. So physiatrist is a physical medicine and rehab physician or an MD. Physical therapist, you know, that's so they're they're all, most physical therapists now are doctors of physical therapy. They are PhDs of physical therapy, but and they a lot of times they do work together. I usually start with the physical therapist. The physiatrist, the way we use them, and and the the Shepherd Center where I'm at is you know they're, they're, we have lots of physiatrists. I usually use them for really refractory spasticity where baclofen and, you know, uh, tizanin even not worked. And we're looking at maybe Botox injections or if we're thinking about an intrathecal baclofen pump to help them help have them help coordinate that. But for typically for managing foot drop, you're going to we would go the physical therapy route. And another question um, says, Dr. Thrower just mentioned baclofen for spasticity. He also said another medication, but didn't I didn't catch the name. Can you say yeah. it again? So that other name is Tizanidine, T-I-Z-A-N-I-D-I-N-E, or the brand name is Xanaflex. So Tizanidine and baclofen are kind of our, our two old standbys. Um, you can't say one's better than the other. They do have different mechanisms of action. We'll usually pick one. If the person does great with it, wonderful. If they have side effects, mainly sedation, we'll try the other one out and see if it does better for them. Uh, you can use them together. They do have different mechanisms of action. Uh, insurance carriers drive us nuts. They'll fight us on using them together, and they'll say, well, you're, you're using two medications for baclofen, said, but, but they're two medicines with very different mechanisms of action. Bridget asks what the purpose of contrast dye for MRIs is. So if when you have active inflammation with a new MS lesion, the door to your central nervous system, the blood-brain barrier is more open than it should be. So inflammatory cells are trafficking into your brain or spinal cord inappropriately. Well, the dye that we get, the contrast, can also traffic into that new lesion. So we use contrast to show acute lesions where there is a tendency towards moving away from using so much contrast. As MRI techniques get better and better, really we can tend to see most of what we need to see on MRI without the contrast. We will, when someone is newly diagnosed or we're doing the, the initial workup for MS, we'll tend to do contrast for the first scan and maybe for a, a year or two after that. But in a, a person with established MS who's been pretty stable, we're tending to use less and less contrast in those individuals. And this is our last question uh, for the night, anonymous attendee. It says, what does it mean if brain volume on neuroscan is at one normative percentile or 99% of people my age, or do 99% of people my age have larger brain volume or is it something else? Yeah, so so if you say that you're at the first percentile, that, that what their assumption is correct. That would mean that 99% of the, the population is has a larger brain volume. Um, I would just call that would imply that there is probably some atrophy from the multiple sclerosis. I would just be cautious, realizing that some of our volumetric studies, again, these are computer generated images. There has been some question about how reliable those are. Um, we realize also that we all have some atrophy with age. All of our brains get smaller as we get older. You know, a healthy 60-year-old brain will look different than a healthy 12-year-old's brain uh, just due to normal, normal atrophy for age. That's all the questions we have. We got to them all. Awesome. Wonderful. 
Yes. So if you guys missed any part of the conference, please head over to Multiple Sclerosis Foundation's um, Facebook page. The live stream there will end as soon as we close out the Zoom here, and then you can watch it from the beginning if you miss anything. Our next conference will be this coming Wednesday, or next Wednesday, rather, April 19th at uh, 3 p.m. with Sherry Benz for Ask BMS Nurse. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for times and access information. We do thank you guys so much for attending. Great questions. And I always love it when we finish all of them before closing. Yeah. Up. Thank you so much, Dr. Thor, for your time. Thank you. Everyone have a great evening. Bye.